perspectives on trauma, sharing our views and healing our world. Hello and welcome to Perspectives on Trauma. With me today is Cindy Hedge of Wildflower Alliance. Welcome, Cindy. Thank you so much for inviting me. <laughs> uh, to begin, could you talk about what is grassroots peer support? So what it means in terms of the Wildflower Alliance is that a lot of people had gone through difficult things, sought help through the mental health system, and maybe some of those things are helpful, and then some of them not only weren't helpful, they felt harmful. Mm -hmm. And people said, you know, what are the alternatives? Can we create other possibilities? What do we wish somebody had done to support us in that moment? And so it's not that we have uh, the one right path for everybody, mm -hmm. but it's to try to create alternatives and, and knowing that each person kind of has to figure out what works for them, mm -hmm. and different things work for different people or in different situations. So it's more like providing choice and options and, and perhaps a vision bigger than what someone might find in the mental health system. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like uh, a response to personalized need. Right, right. And um, in the years that I've been at Wildflower uh, initially, we were uh, funded and was all learning. Our mission statement was all around mental health. Mm -hmm. And then we realized that people's distress was in a context, mm -hmm. right? Let's be curious about that context. So that context might involve different forms of oppression or marginal marginalization or lack of resources. So then it became more like a social change movement because mm -hmm. um, yeah, what actually is supportive and who actually has access to what kinds of supports and, and are there structural barriers that, that are causing distress in somebody's life? Mm. Looking at the importance of working with peers, can you talk about the benefits of that? Oh my gosh, um, I, I have the opportunity to learn about so many different experiences, different beliefs, different ways that people have gotten the beliefs they had, even if they're considered unusual, even if they're diagnosed as a symptom or a disorder. As we do this dive into how they came up with those beliefs, I find out it makes sense in the context of their experience. Mm. So I kind of love it. I love it because I'm always learning more things. And uh, I'm somebody who is in the mental health system kind of stuck. For quite a while, I had GMH services. I was told I had a serious mental illness. Mm -hmm. I'd be on medication my whole life and uh, should be happy for times I wasn't in an institution. Mm -hmm. And basically what happened for me was uh, I was at the point of being prescribed Thorazine. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought if this is as good as it gets, I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. And so I thought about how peer support in the form of 12 step had helped me before. Mm -hmm. And I put my Google search, mental health peer support. And I lived within walking distance of a, a wildflower space in Holyoke. And at the time there were maybe five hearing voices groups in the whole country. Mm -hmm. And they had one. Mm -hmm. And for me, you know, I was experiencing voices mm -hmm. uh, externally and um, and what I was told in the mental health system, you know, you have a disease, your brain's not working right. And what I did was I met people who were told the same things, but they were living life. Mm -hmm. And then come to find out, a lot of these negative messages were messages that I had picked up along with trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, actually hearing the words being repeated as somebody was hurting me. Mm -hmm. These words would come back as voices and echo those messages. Mm -hmm. and, um, so it's really neat to, you know, I get to go all over the country and sometimes the world and then people will say, you know, like they have this moment of like, oh my gosh, you know, putting the pieces of their life together 
in connection with the experience they're having. Mm -hmm. And so I just, you know, I just wish that we could have curiosity about that. Mm -hmm. Like the way the mental health system works now is that, you know, they get a category, a box to hold a bunch of behaviors in. Mm -hmm. It gets a label. And then people say, oh, we know what it is. It fits in this box. And the response is, you know, psych drugs, mm -hmm. which can be helpful and they can not be helpful as well. Um, but sometimes that the curiosity of how did this, how did this person get to this place where they're doing these behaviors, or they're having these thoughts, and that's what's beautiful about, you know, trauma research. There's so much of it mm. has been replicated by the World Health Organization. The relationship between trauma and all sorts of things, not just emotional distress, but longevity, general overall health, education. And, um, and, and sometimes when I say trauma, people just say, oh, you mean child abuse. And it's not just child abuse. Mm -hmm. It could be a pandem pandemic. Mm -hmm. Anything that interrupts meaning, purpose, and connection, anything in which I feel totally powerless. I was very fortunate, uh, a coworker of mine, Natan Cohen, we got to do trauma trainings for the emergency department here in Greenfield, mm -hmm. for a family practice, for OBGYN place, uh, because they're so good at trying to heal somebody's body. But sometimes that life-saving procedure is really traumatic, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes people have all this misplaced shame and guilt. And uh, so it's neat to you know, help people figure out a way of handling these things where you think of the person as a whole person, not just a body, mm -hmm. not just a mind, but like, hey, we saved their life and they're still like, what just happened? I mm -hmm. can't believe it happened. How do I make sense of what happened? And so there's care that needs to come in there and uh, frequently it's not there. Did you find that when you were first starting out with you know, working with peers and people who had you know, similar challenges, did you find that that was empowering or did you find that you were connecting with people differently? Well, it, it was very empowering yeah. and it's not just peers, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. It's human beings, right? We've all suffered loss, right? Mm -hmm. We all, you know, whether it's the opioid epidemic, whether it's COVID, a lot of people have suffered loss. A lot of those COVID nurses, or some of them, started to hear their patients crying, mm -hmm. even when the patient had passed. So my point is this, we're human beings, we go through something tough, and there's ways that human beings adapt. Mm -hmm. And I also work with families, and uh, I have this one slide about the top 10 problematic beliefs that come from trauma. And the parents all fit in the first column. It's mm -hmm. my fault. I should have done something better. I should have known. And so we're like more likely different. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is I try to create a space for people to move through trauma, a, a place where they can't, can't cry. Mm -hmm. And people say, let it out. Or they can't get angry. And we say, we don't say, calm down. Mm -hmm. We say, yeah, I'm mad too. I'm mad that happened to you. Mm -hmm. And this amazing thing happens. I get healed in the process as well because it gives a value to everything I went through. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that somehow this awful stuff I went through puts me in a position where I can connect with somebody else and say, you're not the only one. Mm -hmm. Or it makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, I, like one of the things that um, sometimes comes up is people feel like they're bad or they're evil because something happened and they couldn't stop it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I just say, yeah, that, that makes sense to have that feeling. And did you have any control in this? Mm -hmm. Did you do everything you could? And what is the benefit of blaming yourself for someone else's actions. Mm. So it sounds like um, shame and guilt 
Or Say what you feel no. for a fee. Okay. Uh, just, you, like, imagine this. If you were driving and got in a car accident, and it wasn't your fault, you might still say to yourself, why didn't I see it coming? Mm. Mm. Why didn't I go five minutes later? Why, you know, like, it's, uh, I think, I think people do that because they want to think they have control. Mm. You know, they have control. I can keep my world safe mm. if I'm just careful enough. And, and sometimes you can't. Yeah. With, I guess, with looking at um, helping people through the shame and guilt, I mean, what are some of the ways that you've seen that people are able to just move past it or figure out a way to work with it? Well, I think it's huge to find out you're not the only one. Mm. You know, whatever it is, uh, oh, I had that feeling too. I may not have had the same exact experience as you, mm-hmm. but I may have had the same flawed logic of somehow it's my fault mm-hmm. what somebody else did or whatever happened. And, um, and I think depending on what it is, you know, Another way of addressing shame and guilt is say, you know, for me with my childhood trauma, you know, I'm looking back as, a, as an adult judging the little kid I was, mm, which mm. is totally unfair. Mm. You know, so someone brought me to a playground and said, would you blame that five-year-old if mm. that happened to them? And uh, lots of people have, you know, uh, the term is an uh, inner critic. Mm-hmm. You know, that inner critic might be really judging and shaming, but you would never talk to your best friend that way. Mm-hmm. So how do you become your best friend? How do you have compassion for yourself? And, mm-hmm. and when you can do that, it's awesome because then you have compassion for everybody. So it kind of sounds like forgiveness. Self-forgiveness. Um, yeah, self-forgiveness. Mm-hmm. I'm not as quick about yeah, I have to forgive me mm. first mm-hmm. before I forgive somebody else. Because if I forgive somebody else first, I still have all the anger about what happened. Mm. So in other words, you can be angry about what happened, and that anger has to get out. And I, under that anger is usually grief, loss, or fear, or something else. Like anger is usually secondary emotion. Mm. I have to get that anger out and then realize, you know, that person is just another person Mm -hmm. with their own story. And what they did actually was more about them than me. Mm -hmm. It's a statement of their, you know, their character, not mine. It happened to me, but it's really about, you know, whatever their story is. So you want that engaging in empathy a little bit with even, you know, someone that could be in a But unfortunately, role. we get guilt and shame about not forgiving, mm. right? So I don't think that's helpful. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so like I said, I think I have to feel and process my stuff mm-hmm. and say, okay, that happened to me, but it doesn't have to define me. Mm. You know, it can inform me. Um, like I have to do my work instead of being guilted and shamed for like, well, don't you love that person? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, no, I'm really mad as heck about it. Mm-hmm. And uh, in the mental health system, in my 20 years of research being in it, there was not room for anger. Mm. It was all about containing and controlling. Mm-hmm. There wasn't a lot of room for any big feelings because they would have a fear-based response. Like crying a lot or deeply was seen as, oh no, the person's falling apart Mm. versus this may be the most healing thing that can happen for them right now. Mm. And so let it out. Have you seen changes in the mental health system in these past 20 years moving towards some of that understanding? Well, I've seen, so with all this research around trauma, uh, I've seen people misapply what we're trying to learn from it, mm-hmm. and they have these trauma checklists. Mm. I'm telling you, if I'm having the worst day of my life, I'm being evaluated by the crisis, crisis team, and they want to ask me about the most difficult moments of my life, 
without processing emotion, mm. not good. Like it doesn't make me feel better. Mm -hmm. It kind of destroys me more in that moment. Mm. Um, but there are, there are some people, there are like some wonderful trauma therapists, mm. somatic therapists, which are therapists who work on getting the trauma out of your body. Like I, I may have compartmentalized it in my brain so it's not my memory here, mm -hmm. but I walk in a room and all of a sudden my heart's pounding and I don't know why. And then somebody might be able to say, well, what was in that room? Or what did you see? What did you smell? Mm. You know, and then maybe it will come back to me that my body remembers what happened in a situation that has some similar characteristics. Right? And then if I can go towards that, you know, if I can go towards that, knowing that I'm safe, I'm not alone, I do have power in this situation, even if I didn't then, mm. and oh, by the way, I already survived it, and process it. Yeah, my, um, I'm a person who works with me. I like the Wildflower Alliance got me to a, a place where, okay, now I want to be the expert of my experience. Mm. And, you know, and then uh, if I have somebody support me in, in that. And, uh, and he would say to me, you lived through it, but it was so hard in the moment, you shut down. And your mm. body stored all that. Mm. Which is why, you know, the car accident thing. Like a month later, you could be going by that spot where you had a car accident and your heart's pounding and you have no idea why. Mm. But maybe it comes to you, oh yeah, that's where I had that really horrible accident. Now that doesn't make you crazy or mentally ill. It means you're having a normal reaction to a difficult thing. Mm. But in this society, uh, you know, it's just so much, you know, for people to get paid, they have to give you a diagnosis. Mm. But then once you get a diagnosis, then there's the suggestion of, you know, having some kind of psychiatric drug. Mm. And sometimes the curiosity about why are you having that reaction? Or how did you get to this place in time where, you know, whatever it is, mm. is going on for you. So I get to go from this other place of, uh, for me, it's like solving a mystery. Mm -hmm. How and what world does what this person make sense? Mm -hmm. you know, how does it make sense in what world for them to be doing what they're doing? But I start with that premise. Mm -hmm. Somehow, you know, this is how they've, you know, and that thing, that thing for me, you know, maybe kept me alive as a kid maybe helped me survive, but then it wasn't serving me well as an adult. It's kind of learning which coping techniques work and which ones don't. Right, and it's way more than coping mm -hmm. because, uh, yeah, I can learn how to meditate mm -hmm. or self-soothe, but if I don't get to the root of it, it's going to keep coming up. Mm -hmm. Maybe I navigate better. And for some people, uh, the pain or the horror or the whatever, they don't want to go to, it's too big. Mm. And I respect that. Um, but frequently people are never asked to go there. And it's all about keeping Cindy calm. Mm. Mm. Not about finding out why this was so upsetting to her. Mm. With this um, awareness that seems to be what you're talking about, someone being aware of the reasons why I guess, could you speak a little bit about, you know, the process of getting this awareness? So, if, you know, so in the mental health system, you might be told well, coping strategies, you might be given a sedated drug, mm -hmm. right? So instead, to say to somebody, which was said to me, when does this happen? Let's track when it happens. Are there times it doesn't happen at all? What What's the context of when, whatever, that big fear comes mm -hmm. or whenever that voice comes? Mm -hmm. um, and so that was something that some people did with me. And 
just doing that, I had more power. Oh, when I'm, when I'm playing with kids, I don't hear that. Mm. You know, and then, um, then it was that feeling, that feeling that comes up or that voice that comes up. Have you had that feeling before in your life? It looks like you're talking about behavioral change of actually, you know, attending to when these things occur so you can start kind of unwrapping the reason why. Yeah, so that's, you know, when do they come mm -hmm. in relationship to what? And then to actually go towards it. Mm. To actually, uh, like a Buddhist might say, become the observer. Mm. Instead of saying, I'm angry, anger's in the room. I'm not going to judge it. I'm not going to criticize it. I'm going to be curious about it. Mm -hmm. Gee, anger, why have you showed up? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes when I tell my story and I speak, you, I can see it's touching people. Mm -hmm. And then we got to process it. <clears throat> so that's another way you know, of hearing other people's stories. But the things we feel the most shame and guilt about, we generally don't talk about, right? Mm -hmm. And so to get those stories out. Um, so something huge on my heart is that, yeah, there can be all sorts of trauma. Trauma is personal. Mm -hmm. What might be traumatic to me might not be to you and vice versa. Like they have this adverse childhood experience study. Vincent Folletti of the Center for Disease Control has been replicated. One of his questions was, did you lose your parents to divorce? And some of that is adverse. Mm -hmm. For me, it was, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Please, I don't want to hear you fight anymore. Like it was a good thing. But for a lot of people, it would be this really tough thing. Mm -hmm. And kids you know, that magical thinking that I have control. If I was just good enough, my parents wouldn't get divorced. If I tried harder. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one issue that trauma is very personal. It's not trauma Olympics. It's about the impact. Mm -hmm. right? I'm always like trying to figure out how that impacted somebody. Mm -hmm. um, but so many people in this world do experience childhood sexual abuse. Mm. And it doesn't get reported. Uh, I have a friend who uh, told his dad about a teacher. Mm. And the dad's response is, you don't want to make that accusation. You would really mess up their life. Mm. Or, or people who see things, but they look the other way because they don't want to believe it. Mm. Um, and the thing is, when, when you don't see say something, that person tends to go on and on. And the person who's being abused tends to get end up in the mental health system and told there's something wrong with them. Mm. And meanwhile, you know, the other person is, you know, a huge T V star, mm. a huge rock mm. star, mm -hmm. you know, an Olympic uh physician, mm -hmm. right? And uh, it really uh, irritates me. Mm. So there's, there's this ripple effect of not, not you know, these things staying hidden and not being out so maybe some healing can take place. Right. And, um, and not only that, that it's like the society looks down on the person who's having a hard time with having gone through it. They become even more marginalized. So, like, if you, but we have all this information, we have all this research, mm -hmm. and yet somehow we're not applying it in the mental health field. Mm. Well, I guess to start closing up a little bit, you know, you, you talk about maybe your experiences with with the mental health field. You know, are there things that are in practice now that you feel that are, you know. Still beneficial, or do you see changes? What, what, do you, what are your, I guess, your assessment right now of? Uh, I believe people should have choice, mm -hmm. and rarely, but sometimes I see somebody get on a 
a psychiatric medication and it's a game changer for them. Mm -hmm. I had a friend who lived in New York City and said he couldn't do it without taking lithium. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I can't visit you without taking Ativan. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> but then after a while, his body couldn't take the lithium. Mm -hmm. So he moved to Southern California. I changed his lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think there are some things that are really helpful, mm -hmm. but I think the orientation of it kind of uh, screws it all up. Mm -hmm. And, and um, in that if I'm always assuming there's something wrong with you versus there's something right about you and maybe something wrong has happened to you, mm -hmm. it kind of warps. And there are great people in the mental health field, but it's more like the, the structure of it. Mm -hmm. I also think the structure of it, if it was more family or community oriented, like when I was a kid, if I ended up in the mental health system, like if I told anybody what I was thinking or feeling, would they have worked with my family? Mm. Would they have looked at that context? For me as a kid, uh, my mom had, um, she had issues, went to a psychiatrist and he said, don't drink and take Valium. And it made everything worse. And nobody was talking to us kids. Mm. Or the way it's set up now, somebody might be sent to a residential program, uh, a person under 18 might go to a program. Nobody's working with a family. Maybe that program's working. Maybe this kid is doing way better, but nobody's telling the family what it is the kid needs mm. to do well, right? It's all, we're gonna talk about the identified patient mm. versus the larger community that people interface with. Mm. And the last thing I wanna say really is there are so many paths to healing. Mm. There's so many uh, possibilities out there beyond a hospital and beyond psychiatric medication. Mm -hmm. You know, there's pills that help me sleep, mm -hmm. right? Pills that help me calm down, but there's not a pill to heal trauma. Mm -hmm. But maybe jumping up and down, dancing and singing <laughs> and having a blast mm -hmm. is a great mood elevator, right? Or having a place where it's okay to cry or be angry and be validated. Mm -hmm. So to be seen, heard, and validated to be part of your own rescue or healing, um, to get perspective on shame and guilt, and to have human connection. These, these things, however you get them, wherever you get them, can heal, you know, mitigate the impact of trauma. Mm. Well, Cindy, I wanna thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today, um, and I wish you the very best. Thank you so much. <laughs>